Hello friends, welcome to the online course of aerodynamics. As all of you know, the situation we are in. So we have decided to transform all the classes into the online materials, uh, whether it is via uh, Edmodo, YouTube or Zoom, uh, all classes will be taught online. It covers uh, the basics of aerodynamics. And in the module 2, we are going to cover basics of aerodynamics. That is, uh, we start with airfoil nomenclature and its characteristics. So why nomenclature is important? Because uh, if you are an aircraft designer, an aerodynamicist, you should know which airfoil to use for the given client requirements. right? So for this, the basic understanding of airfoil nomenclature is very important. Next, we'll move on to define airfoil characteristics. How you are going to define an airfoil? What are the properties? What makes a good airfoil? Right? So we will answer all these questions in this particular module. Then we'll move on to the wing geometry. Right? Airfoil is just a cross section of the entire wing. So the entire wing analysis we are going to do, we are going to calculate the, all the aerodynamic forces the wing is going to generate and its moments as well. Right? Whenever for, force comes into picture, uh, moment also comes into picture depending on the reference. Right? Then we will shift our uh, discussion to the center of pressure and uh, aerodynamic center. Both the terms uh, we have understood in previous lectures, uh, whether it is in uh, elements of aeronautics or uh, in the previous module, right? Uh, we will uh, do a quick revision about it and then we will move on to uh, pressure coefficient, right? Like how uh, aerodynamic forces are defined, how aerodynamic forces can be calculated using the calculated pressure coefficient values. Next, we will move on. Uh, for, uh, to develop equations for lift and drag uh, measured from the surface pressure distributions, right? So, uh, with this, uh, we will come to the end. Before ending the module, we will cover uh, different types of drags, right? Which is very important for the uh, next module, right? So, this is the overview of second module. So, let's begin with uh, this lecture. Uh, the basic fundamental force in aerodynamics is nothing but the lift and drag and moments, right? So here is the lift force, which is equal to half rho v square uh, s into cl, right? Where rho is uh, density, v is the free stream velocity, s is the planform area, and cl is the coefficient of lift. Now the basic definition of lift itself is, it is the component of resultant aerodynamic force perpendicular to the free stream velocity, right? It's a force resolved from a resultant aerodynamic force which is perpendicular to the free stream velocity v infinity, right? Now if I uh, transform uh, half rho v square into the dynamic pressure, I like to call it as Q infinity, which is dynamic pressure. So lift, I can write it as QSCL, right? Where Q is the dynamic pressure, S is the planform area, and CL is the coefficient of lift. Now, a quick revision here uh, I would like to make. The sum of pressure energy and kinetic energy remains constant. That is, P plus half rho V square is uh, constant. If I apply it for two sections, that is, for 1 and 2, I would get uh, P1 plus half rho 1 V1 square is equal to P2 plus half rho 2 V2 square. Now, here I would like to introduce a concept of uh, static stagnation and dynamic pressure. Right? So now, uh, let's assume the fluid is flowing from section 1 to section 2. At section 2, I will make the fluid to come to rest adiabatically. Now, when this happens adiabatically, of course, the velocity comes to rest. The velocity becomes zero 
at second section but at the same time how that velocity is becoming zero I am doing it adiabatically right so adiabatically I am slowing the flow to zero velocity so what happens the right hand side uh, velocity term gets eliminated and I am left only with the pressure term right so if I simplify this I can write it as P1 plus half rho 1 V1 square is equal to P2 now this P2 is nothing but the stagnation pressure P0 which is the pressure at a station where the free stream velocity is zero or it is brought to zero adiabatically so that is stagnation pressure now on the LHS I have two terms one is a static pressure and the other is dynamic pressure now the sum of static and dynamic pressure results in the total pressure right uh, so why I would like to revise this is the dynamic pressure is nothing but half rho v square which is in other terms it is nothing but the kinetic energy right so in a fluid flow what is its dynamic pressure is nothing but the is defined by its kinetic energy right moving on to the drag force right we studied lift I defined lift as it is a resultant force it is a component of resultant force perpendicular to the free stream velocity now drag on the other hand it is also a component of resultant velocity but it is parallel to the free stream velocity as all of you know the resultant force can be resolved vertical and horizontal with a given reference now in this case our reference is free stream velocity right so when I resolve the forces perpendicular to the free stream velocity that force I call it as lift and the other force which I resolve parallel to the free stream velocity that I call, like to call it as drag uh, forces are same so the definition is same but with a little difference that is drag is equal to half rho v square s into cd where cd is called as the coefficient of drag so the study of aerodynamics and your uh, future career is purely based on how to reduce this coefficient of drag so various materials or various shapes exhibit different different coefficient of drag let's say let me ask you a question all of you know we use airfoil shape in the wing my question to you is can I use a circular cylinder as a wing right you can pause this video now you can go into the comment section and write your answer right can I use a circular cylinder as a wing right very interesting idea yes it is possible but I would like to know your uh, point of view why it is possible and why it is uh, not practical right there is a difference between being possible but being not practical right so let's discuss it in the comment section i would take uh, this concept this idea in the further lectures so now moving on so <clears throat> once we define lift and drag now uh, the time is to discuss about the moment moment is nothing but force into the perpendicular distance right force can be lift and drag and the distance is nothing but where we are going to consider the lift and drag and from that point to the CG that is the distance so that is nothing but the moment right so in this case uh, in uh, the two diagrams mentioned here in the first diagram I have defined something called as the C by 4 which is nothing but the quarter chord point what do you mean by quarter chord point right if you see carefully the total length of the chord is C right I represent it by C now 25% of the chord length I would like to call it as quarter chord point and that is represented by C by 4 right so that is a standard point 
uh, in uh, further lectures we are going to discuss why it is so important but for your knowledge um, this point is called as aerodynamic center now aerodynamic center is uh, in most of the cases it is considered as the reference uh, for all the analysis we can consider cg point also uh, at this point i would like to mention that cg is different from aerodynamic center cg lies at different position aerodynamic center lies at different position but there may be cases where both may coincide right but in usually practical uh, aerofoils most of the times these two points are different right okay now if you see the second diagram i have defined the moment at leading edge unlike in the first diagram i have defined a moment at aerodynamic center right both the moments are right i can define moments wherever i want starting from the leading edge to the trailing edge right so in the first case i have defined the moment at quarter chord point in the second diagram i have defined the moment at leading edge of course both the values are different values are not same but i can define the moments at any point wherever i want so for uh, your understanding for this particular example i have considered two cases uh, where i have defined moment one at the quarter chord point another at the uh, leading edge right so the equation for moment uh, can be given as half rho v square s into cm uh, c is the chord here and cm is the coefficient of moment half rho v square s into cm is nothing but a force uh, term multiplied by the chord length that is the c represents the moment right so <clears throat> with this we understood what is left what is a drag and what is moment right with this uh, knowledge continuing our discussion into resolving uh, the net resultant force on an airfoil <clears throat> there are various ways uh, in which you can resolve the forces so we are going to see two methods of how to resolve uh, the resultant aerodynamic force right in this particular diagram Uh, you can see v infinity is the free stream velocity which uh, we have assumed to be horizontal and the chord line is at an angle of alpha with respect to the free stream velocity right so there are uh, multiple ways of uh, resolving the resultant aerodynamic force in this case the resultant aerodynamic force is represented by r that is capital r Now the first way is uh, the more uh, you know uh, universal way that is parallel and perpendicular to the free stream velocity, right? Uh, so that uh, those resolved forces are called as lift and drag respectively. Uh, there is another way of representing this uh, resultant aerodynamic force, and that is resolving the R. perpendicular and parallel to the chord line now that is called as the one uh, resolved force which is perpendicular to the chord line is called as the normal force and it is represented by n and the axial force or the force parallel to the chord line is represented by a and it is called as axial force right so there are two ways in which you can uh, resolve the forces one is lift and drag and the second is normal force and axial force now if you want to write uh, the geometric relationship between uh, these two resolved forces that is l and d lift and drag and normal force and axial force that is n and a now first equation i can write it as uh, lift is equal to the component of normal force in the direction of l that is the lift direction that is n cos alpha minus the component of axial force which is in the opposite direction of lift but is it is in the same uh, line of force 
right so that is why negative sign so n cos alpha minus a sin alpha is the lift force similarly the drag can be written as uh, the component of normal force in the direction of drag that is n sin alpha and the component of axial force again in the direction of drag d that is a cos alpha so drag i can write it as n sin alpha plus a cos alpha right now moving on as you can see on the left hand side we have assumed an airfoil it is uh, a thick airfoil to make the concepts more clear the thickness is more usually this won't be the case in practical applications right so uh, free stream velocity again is at an angle of attack uh, alpha with respect to the chord line and we have considered two points on the airfoil point a and point b respectively on upper surface and lower surface of the airfoil right so with these two points uh, the pressure force acting at, at these two points i call it as uh, pressure on the upper surface and pressure on the lower surface which is represented by pu and pl right so this is nothing but the pressure acting on the upper surface and lower surface so in the introduction class of aerodynamics uh, we have discussed how the resultant aerodynamic force that is r capital r is the resultant of only two parameters whatever may be the uh, in this universe whatever uh, forces whatever net forces are generated that is purely based on two forces one is the pressure force and the other one is shear stress force or the shear force in simple words right so these two force together causes the resultant force causes a force to develop in the body that is nothing but the resultant force so here in this particular diagram i have defined both pressure force and shear stress force or shear force at both the points a and b so what is pressure force at point a that is which is on the upper surface it is pressure on the upper surface at point a multiplied by plan form area of the upper surface which is nothing but pressure is equal to force per unit area hence force is equal to pressure multiplied by the area so in this case upper surface pressure multiplied by plan form area of the upper surface that is pressure force right acting at an angle of theta with respect to vertical at point a and at the same point a the shear stress is acting what is uh, shear stress first of all the definition of shear stress is as follows it is a stress developed within the body when the applied force is parallel to the surface so this is shear stress unlike normal stress a normal stress is developed due to the load applied perpendicular to the surface when you apply a load perpendicular to the surface that stress developed within the body is called as normal stress whereas when the same load is applied parallel to the surface the stresses developed are called as uh, shear stresses now shear stress multiplied by area we get shear force right so we have shear force as tau u that is shear stress on the upper surface multiplied by plan form area of the upper surface that is su right now tau u into su gives the shear force at point a right so i have defined normal force that is pressure force and shear force at point a so similarly the same methodology can be followed at point b as well so i have defined tau l into sl that is shear stress on the lower surface at point b multiplied by the plan form area of the lower surface this is a uh, shear force on the lower surface at point b 
Then in the similar way I have defined the pressure force on the lower surface at point B as pressure on the lower surface into planform area of the lower surface. So I have defined four forces, two on the upper surface, two on the lower surface. Two forces consist of pressure force and shear force, right? So all these forces, now we can use it to develop equations for the net resultant force, right? Which is nothing but uh, the normal force and axial force. First, we will derive equations for this. Then, we will convert this normal and axial force into lift and drag. First, we will calculate uh, normal force and axial force. Then, we will convert this normal and axial force into lift and drag respectively. Right? So, first, we will see the methodology how to get this normal force and axial force. Right? So, we have considered an elemental uh, surface area. So, at that point, a, I am going to define the normal force, right? So, uh, very small elemental force on the upper surface, which is acting normal to the surface. I call it as d n dash u. What is d n dash u? N u is the normal force acting on the upper surface. d n dash u is the elemental normal force acting on the upper surface. So, what this consists of? It consists of the component of pressure force, I repeat again, listen very carefully, the normal force, elemental normal force at point A on the upper surface consists of the components of pressure force and shear force in the direction perpendicular to the x-axis. So this is normal force, right? So what those terms are? P on the upper surface, that is pressure on the upper surface. DSU is the elemental surface area of the upper surface. And cos theta, of course, is the angle uh, in which uh, angle of inclination of pressure force with respect to vertical. Alright, then this is the first term. And the second uh, component is the component of uh, shear force acting in the direction of pressure force. Right, what is that? Tau u, that is the shear stress on the upper surface, multiplied by d into su, that is the elemental surface area, multiplied by sine theta, right? So both are acting opposite to the normal force, hence the negative sign. Similar analysis goes for uh, the axial force on the upper surface, that is the elemental axial force on the upper surface, that is why we have used uh, the notation d. D of A dash U, that is the elemental uh, axial force on the upper surface, right? So, same analysis goes for elemental uh, normal and axial force on the lower surface as well, right? <coughs> Moving on. So, you can pause the video right here, note down all the four equations, understand and then you can proceed. Moving on. At point A, that is uh, per unit span as we speak, uh, the normal force is given as at all from leading edge to trailing edge, at all points these individual forces that is pressure force and shear force at each and every point from leading edge to trailing edge, if I integrate, I get the total force on the upper surface and the second term represents the total force from leading edge to the trailing edge on the lower surface. So that is the net normal force per unit span. So n dash or the difference between n dash and m is n dash represents per unit span what is the force. So if we multiply by the total span we get n right so similar analysis is followed by a dash a dash is the total axial force per unit span span means the distance from uh, one end to another end of the wing right so the first term again represents the total force 
in the direction in the axial direction on the upper surface and the second term represents the total force in the axial direction on the lower surface so if i add both of these that is the net force on the upper surface the net force on the lower surface i get the net axial force per unit span of course right now recalling the previous equations what we derived that is l is equal to that is the net lift is nothing but n cos alpha minus a sin alpha and the total drag uh, is nothing but n sin alpha plus a cos alpha right in these two equations if i substitute the value of uh, the normal force n and the axial force a i am going to get lift and drag forces so this is one method to get the values of lift and drag so in aerodynamics uh, we are more interested in defining or understanding few dimensionless quantities the reason is when you talk about dimensionless quantities it represents numbers which we can easily interpret right when the dimension is involved there are many variables so in this dimensionless quantity uh, you are going to get a value which is not having any dimension so let's see few dimensionless quantities so beginning with the lift coefficient uh, as we have seen the equation for lift that is l is equal to half rho v square s into cl so cl is nothing but uh, it's a constant we get when we remove the proportionality constant from uh, the lift equation that is uh, the basic lift equation l is equal to half rho v square s uh, into cl we obtained it using a principle called as buckingham uh, pi theorem so with this theorem i assume that the lift force depends on the velocity the density of the air and the planform area of the wing itself and then using this uh, assumption i derived uh, the lift equation and finally i got uh, lift is proportional to uh, density velocity square and uh, the planform area and when i remove the proportionality constant i get a constant called as coefficient of lift so coefficient of lift i can define it as the ratio of lift to the uh, product of dynamic pressure and planform area that is l by q infinity into s similarly i can define coefficient of drag or a drag coefficient or cd is nothing but the ratio of drag force to the product of uh, dynamic pressure and planform area so similar uh, definition goes for normal force coefficient that is cn and axial force coefficient that is ca and of course when we analyze forces we have to remember we should always include moment so that is where moment coefficient comes into picture that is cm which is the ratio of net moment divided by the dynamic the product of dynamic pressure planform area and the total chord length right so this is uh, the these are few dimensionless quantities which we will be using in the study of aerodynamics right now moving on to the airfoil nomenclature right so <clears throat> aerodynamics starts with airfoils so we will try to define what is an airfoil right as you can see on the image on the left image we have an aircraft with its wing if i put a plane perpendicular to the wing such that it cuts the wing the shape what we see at the edges uh, that is called as airfoil shape now uh, what you are seeing here is the result of uh, years of research in aerodynamics so previously the airfoil shape nobody knew what it was until right brothers tested uh, roughly around 200 airfoils in their own wind tunnel so then people started thinking that airfoils results in minimum drag compared to other shapes right you can use other shapes 
uh, for wind in the previous lecture i asked you a question whether uh, can you use uh, cylinder as wings the answer is yes you can use but the net drag uh, developed by the cylinder cylindrical wings are much much higher than the net drag developed by uh, airfoil shaped wings right uh, so this cross section is called as an airfoil right so there can be many shapes there can be thousands of designs of airfoil now how to differentiate different airfoils for that we need to define few terms right so let's define let's start with the leading edge so the front portion of the airfoil is called as leading edge and the rear portion is called as the trailing edge right and a straight line joining these two points that is the leading edge and trailing edge is called as chord line right and if the airfoil is curved in nature right so i can draw a line throughout the airfoil such that the distance between the upper surface and lower surface remains constant and that line is called as mean camber line right and the thickness between mean camber line and the chord line is called as camber camber of the airfoil more the camber of the airfoil more will be the uh, turning of the air around the airfoil more the turning more will be the change in momentum more will be the change in momentum more will be the change in pressure right so this is how uh, turning an airfoil or turning a surface results in different pressure distribution and the distance between the upper surface and lower surface measured perpendicular to the chord line is called as the thickness of the airfoil right so for any given airfoil uh, let's say if its thickness is like uh, 20% of the chord it means its maximum thickness is 20% of the total chord length usually all the parameters what we discussed now uh, we define it in terms of chord length uh, individually we will not uh, define them we will try to convert all the values in terms of chord length right now the next question uh, we should be asking is for any change in angle of attack uh, angle of attack is defined as the angle between the free stream velocity vector and the chord line right so if i keep on changing this angle of attack how what parameters will change so the first answer for that is coefficient of lift the moment you change the angle of attack the coefficient of lift for that particular airfoil changes if i increase the angle of attack from 0 to 5 degrees the coefficient of lift also increases linearly but in this particular graph as you can see although the angle of attack is 0 there is some finite coefficient of lift present in the airfoil now the reason is this particular airfoil is a cambered airfoil right what is a cambered airfoil for that we need to define a symmetric airfoil a symmetric airfoil is one whose upper surface is identical to the lower surface that is a symmetric and an unsymmetric airfoil is called as cambered airfoil where upper surface is not same as the lower surface to be more specific upper surface is more curved than the lower surface because of this the coefficient of lift exists even if the angle of attack is zero that is if the angle between velocity vector and the chord line is zero still the air, the wing can generate lift or the airfoil generates the net resultant aerodynamic force right very interesting concept uh the same <coughs> concept if we uh try to understand for symmetric airfoil for symmetric airfoil the curve starts from the origin right so when angle of attack is zero coefficient of lift will also be zero uh, very interesting phenomena here so when coefficient of lift 
for a cambered airfoil becomes zero that is at a slight negative value of angle of attack right so let's say for this case usually typically for a uh, cambered airfoil uh, the zero lift angle of attack will be around minus two to minus four degrees right which means <coughs> The chord length, the angle between the chord length and velocity vector is negative, right? But for a symmetric airfoil, at zero angle of attack, the coefficient of lift will be zero, right? This is very important distinction between symmetric and cambered airfoil, right? Next, we will try to understand the drag curve, right? A drag curve is nothing but, uh, we also call this curve as the drag polar. Uh, it represents uh, the variation of coefficient of drag with the angle of attack right as you can see as the angle of attack increases from more negative value the coefficient of drag keeps on decreases right at certain angle of attack the coefficient of drag reaches minimum value and again beyond that angle of attack the coefficient of drag keeps on increases Right? This is very important graph uh, with respect to this particular course. I will end this lecture here. So, in the next lecture, uh, we will be discussing about uh, the Naka airfoil series, that is the nomenclature part, and about the flow separation at high angles of attack. Uh, we will try to understand why it happens and what are the reasons for that. We will move on to the wing nomenclature. We will move on to the, uh, to the calculation of center of pressure, uh, coefficient of pressure and aerodynamic center. So uh, till now what we have studied is we studied the basics of aerodynamics, uh, how lift takes place, how drag generates and what about uh, the normal and axial force. So two ways to represent forces, uh, normal force, axial force or uh, lift and drag, angle of attack and uh, moments, uh, non-dimensional numbers. When you come to the next lecture, uh, revise all the concepts and uh, be prepared. Uh, so I will meet you in the next lecture. Thank you.